Summer of 2008, and to hopefully spark anything of substance around young superstar Rick Nash, the Columbus Blue Jackets have stripped their roster to the studs. Nash now tries to split the defense and walk in. Nice move! Another nice move! Oh. He scores! Oh. What a goal! Oh. It doesn't get any better than this! Oh. Rick Nash, how do you do? Oh. Oh. For parts of the last three seasons, the Blue Jackets had banked heavily on aging Hall of Fame talent Sergei Fedorov. But at last year's trade deadline, as Fedorov's offense declined well below first-line center levels, the Blue Jackets pulled the shoot, sending him to Washington for Notre Dame defenseman Theo Ruth. That same day, the Blue Jackets had already shipped off Captain Adam Foote for picks, giving the C to Nash. Former 30 goal scorer Frederick Modin looked like he would never be the same as he struggled with back injuries, and original Blue Jacket David Viborny was headed back to the Czech Republic despite still being a solid contributor. Deeks scores! David Viborny! And yes, the magic man has spoken, ties it at one. Power play quarterback and defensive stalwart Ron Hainsey was also likely to leave in free agency, having earned a big raise from his current salary of $737,000. Michael Pekka, though over the hill offensively, was also likely to test the market, really hollowing out Columbus's center depth. This team needed to be almost entirely reconstructed with one goal in mind. Finally, get Rick Nash to the playoffs. Step one, get him a center. Using the first round pick obtained in the foot trade, Columbus traded for winger R.J. Umberger of the Flyers. You may notice R.J. is not a center but the Blue Jackets hoped to shift Umberger to center full-time. Luckily, he had played the position in Columbus before, during his time at Ohio State. But it was yet to be seen if he could be a truly effective centerman in the NHL. On July 1st, the Blue Jackets made the decision to cut bait on former 6th overall pick Gilbert Brule, getting struggling enigma Rafi Torres in return. The Blue Jackets drafted Brule to try to fill their eternal vacancy at center. Busts happen. Let's look at who was picked next. Oh, man. That same day, Columbus brought in a player in the mold of Adam Foote, signing Mike Commodore, who was a solid third-pairing piece, but unproven in a larger role. The next day, the Blue Jackets found their Hainsey replacement. Columbus sent out dissatisfied forward Nikolai Zherdev and young roster player Dan Fritchie to the Rangers for defenseman Fedor Tutin and Christian Backman. Tootin had been a very solid middle-pairing defenseman for the Rangers last year and was seen as someone capable of more. Right side, Tootin scores on a slapper! Backman was a perfectly competent bottom-pairing guy. Zherdev had been the number two option to Nash last year and would only be 24 at the start of the season, but his relationship with management throughout his time in Columbus had been mixed to say the least. Here comes Zherdev. Down the left wing, steps away from Ladd, walks in and across the line, yeah. scores! Coast to coast, he does it the most, and the Jackets take the lead! Regardless, the loss of his scoring would need to be offset, and the Blue Jackets didn't wait long to find his replacement. The Blue Jackets needed a winger with experience playing opposite a Rocket Richard winning power forward. Who's been playing with a Ginla? Christian Husalius. Uh, perfect, we'll take him. While he didn't have the dazzle or ceiling of Zherdev, Husalius had been more productive, and though he would have to play on his offside with Nash, he was poised to continue that trend. To call Husalius an Aginla product doesn't really do him justice. He was an extremely effective penalty killer and defensive forward with tremendous puck skills and finishing ability. Nash, Umberger, and Husalius was set to be the best line in Columbus in years. Michael Pekka re-signed. That's nice. Even though he's completely washed, he was third on the team in scoring in 2008 behind Nash and Zherdev. Former Calder finalist Mike York is signed on as a reclamation project, but now that their offseason is over, it has to be said. This team's center depth is still brutal. Umberger, barely a center. Manny Malhotra, very good defensive forward, but he does not bring enough offense to be a second-line center. Michael Pekka, similar to Malhotra, good defensively, but a non-factor as an offensive driver. And rookie Derek Broussard is the wild card. If he can break out and play a top six role, that will solve a lot of this team's problems. But his two points in 17 games last season didn't really inspire much confidence. The defense is good. There aren't any bad players here. 
Toon is the definite number one guy, likely leaves something to be desired, but he, Jan Hayda, Rusty Klesla, Mark Mathot, Mike Commodore, and Chris Russell are all extremely capable in their own zone. They will insulate a position that didn't shift in the offseason, Columbus's franchise goalie. Last year, everything clicked for former 8th overall pick Pascal LeClaire as he became the first Blue Jackets goalie ever to have a winning record. After years of Mark Denis and Ron Tugnut, LeClaire has given the Blue Jackets real hope in net and is likely the most important player on this team other than Nash. Opening night in Dallas, 19-year-old rookie Jacob Voracek scores and no one seems to care. Play keeps going. Dallas goalie Marty Turco keeps looking behind him because he didn't feel the shot or hear the post. Eventually, the game comes to a halt and it's determined Voracek's shot went in. This is Voracek's first career goal and Columbus's first of the season, and they barely got to celebrate. Mike Commodore looks like a beast early, smearing Sean Avery. Pascal LeClaire looks stellar until he's caught floundering on a Dallas power play goal. Come to think of it, even on his saves, he looks like he's fighting it a bit. He doesn't get down into the butterfly very well. After James Neal gave the Stars the lead, Christian Husalius ties it, taking advantage of some friendly fire from Stars forward Steve Ott. Husalius scores! And the Jackets have tied it up! Christian Husalius, his first goal and first point as a Columbus Blue Jacket. In quick succession, Andrew Murray and Derek Broussard establish a 4-2 Columbus lead. The Stars answer back with two quick goals of their own, the tying goal on a blast from Daly being one LeClaire would probably want back. Late in OT, of course, it's Nash to end it. Backman jumps up, back for Rick Nash, pulls the trigger, oh! scores! Rick Nash takes the Chimera pass and the Jackets win it over a tie! The emergence of Broussard and Voracek in this game was massive. If they can make up a second line with a speedster like Jason Chimera or veteran like Modine, the offense won't be nearly as top-heavy. Game 2 was a loss, but Broussard scored again. That's a good sign. Game 3, and... Guys, I think we need to talk about Pascal. He's not been very good. He particularly can't play the puck, giving up two goals for miscues with the puck on his stick. Here's Sheriff Breakaways. They've got to be aware, and there it is. Another short-handed goal. Oh, my. LeClaire plays the next game but leaves with an injury and seeds the next start to Frederick Norena. Alright, Norena has been a starter. Oh no. Okay, so Norena is not going to take the net from LeClaire. On that power play situation. Norena on the dump in, got a little handcuff. LeClaire comes back and has a few good games but takes a shot up high against the Wild and leaves with an injury once again. Norena gets the net for the next four games, and then Jackets go 1-1-2, one, one, and two, bringing the team's record to 4-6-2 and two on the year. The top two lines look great so far, so trying another option in net makes sense, especially when it's a top prospect. Steve Mason was fresh off an elite showing at the World Juniors, where his 9.51 save percentage won Canada gold and himself the tournament MVP. A good start in Syracuse and the injury to LeClaire had opened the door. November 5th, in an unassuming game against Edmonton, Mason will get his shot. Late in the first, the fairly new line of Husalius, Broussard, and Voracek get things going. Then, Broussard doubles the lead early in the second. The Oilers then pour it on with four straight goals. Some snipes, some bad defense, but ultimately, you would hope Mason could have stopped one or two of them. But the Jackets don't give up, tying the game thanks to goals from Umberger and Modine. Following a Rafi Torres penalty late in the game, the Jackets come rumbling into the Edmonton zone, where Manny Malhotra jams home the eventual game winner. Torres! Oh, he did not! Rebound goes! Rafi Torres, the former Oiler! Justice is served! Out of the box and into the lead! Mason wasn't great, giving up four goals on 26 shots. But given that Columbus won, it was worth giving him another chance in the next game. Columbus beat the eight 1-1 one one Canadians in a shootout where Mason let up only three goals on 37 shots. Okay, we'll play him again. Mason allows only one goal to the potent Calgary Flames offense. Oh, and by the way, Derek Broussard has officially broken out. Bouncing puck on the right. Look at Broussard! Watch in! Here's Broussard! Score! What a beautiful goal! Derek Broussard with his team leading six.
Leclerc returns soon after, and it looks like he and Mason will form a platoon until Leclerc gets demolished for seven goals on 19 shots by the Oilers. They're not all his fault, but it is not a good game from Leclerc. Mason pitches his first career shutout in Columbus's next game. During their short stint as a platoon, Leclerc goes 1-3 with an 863 save percentage. Mason goes 3-3-1 with a 928 save percentage. The competition is over. This is Steve Mason's net. The Blue Jackets hovered around 500, but hit the skids following a 6-5 shootout loss to Dallas in a game where Nash was a monster and Columbus had 66% of the shot attempts. I don't really want a dogpile, but I think you know which goalie was in net. Centering pass, off. A Columbus player, and Erickson's got his second of the night, tied 2-2. Finds Lundqvist in the corner, Richards goes to the net, Lundqvist for Richards! Puck in the paint, it's loose, and it's in the net! It's a tough night for Pascal Leclerc. To make matters worse, the Jackets thought they had the game won in OT, but Manny Malhotra's goal was called back due to a kick. This was Pascal Leclerc's last game this year, as yet another injury will keep him out for the rest of the season. Leclerc wasn't the only injury. Derek Broussard separated his shoulder fighting James Neal in the first period, and with 25 points in 31 games, he's done for the year. Even with Mason and Nett, the next two games went poorly for Columbus. Two losses, two shutouts. Columbus now sits at 14, 16, and 4. It's time for Steve Mason to win them some games. Mason shuts out the Flyers. He doesn't face many shots, but makes a few critical saves, leading the Blue Jackets to a 3-0 win. Two days later, the Jackets square off against the Kings. Mason slams the door again. Same story, not tested much, but tremendous when he is. Another two days pass, in another shutout, this time over the Ducks, and Steve Mason is the talk of the league. 938 save percentage, 1.68 GAA. It's worthwhile to talk about Columbus coach Ken Hitchcock, who is a spectacular defensive coach, and his possession-centered style insulates goalies very well. For a young, hyper-talented goalie like Mason, it's a perfect situation. The other thing about Ken Hitchcock is, even though this team has an elite scorer like Nash, a setup man like Husalius, and is strong and even strength, their power play is abysmal. Even after demolishing the Avalanche 6-1 in their next game in a Nash masterclass, the Columbus power play sits at 18 for 169 on the season, 10.7%. They are on pace to be one of the 10 worst power plays of all time. They need to score more. To remedy that, they bring in forward Jason Williams from Atlanta, who does give the team a bit of a boost as they head toward the trade deadline. The team is in conservative buyer's shape for the March 4th deadline and are expected to make some moves. There are, however, more issues. Steve Mason, since taking the net in mid-December, has played 29 of a possible 33 games. Fatigue has become a factor. At the end of a stretch where Mason played six games in nine days, the 20-year-old got stomped by fellow playoff bubble team the Anaheim Ducks, allowing five goals on just 13 shots in a loss. Being a bubble team, the Blue Jackets aren't going to leverage the future, but the injured Pascal Leclerc could likely be on the move now that Mason is the established goalie of the future. That is exactly what happens. Pascal Leclerc and a second-round pick are sent to Ottawa for center Antoine Vermette. Vermette has a reputation as a defensive specialist because he wins a lot of face-offs and plays on the penalty kill, but his real value comes from his offensive smarts and shot. Even though he's having a down year, Vermette will immediately fill the void left by the Broussard injury and move Umberger back to the wing. Vermette livens up the Jackets as they go 8-3-4, Hitchcock feasts on the loser point, after the deadline, and they head into a game against the Blackhawks with a chance to clinch their first ever playoff berth. Mason has played all but one of those 15 games and boasts a 920 save percentage during the stretch, but though he didn't allow a goal through the first 60 minutes last night against the Hawks, it wasn't enough for Columbus to get the win. These Blackhawks are very close to the team that will win the Cup next season just with Martin Havlat instead of Marion Hossa. Beating them to punch your ticket to the playoffs is a tall ask. Nine minutes into the first, Jacob Voracek shows the passing ability that will make him a lot of money in the future, hitting a poaching Rick Nash in stride for a breakaway. 
Duncan Keith, who at the time is one of the fastest skaters in the league, runs down Nash but hooks him trying to break up the shot. Opportunity go either way. All right, Nash, who leads him with 38 goals, the first great chance of the game to score. Here's Nash to the net. On the blocker side. Happy Bullen shuts down the shot, and Nash is barraged with jeers from the Chicago crowd. A few minutes later, Mathot blisters a shot off the post that bounces off the back of Habibulin right to Vermette, who shoots it off the other post. With six minutes left in the first, Blackhawks defenseman Brian Campbell from below his own circles looks up to see that Brent Seabrook's penalty is ending, then nails him with a wicked pass to send him in on a breakaway where he opens the scoring. With under a minute left in the period, the Hawks come in on an odd man rush, but Mason seems to have it under control. Nash then makes an utterly confounding play, attempting to defend a pass to what I can only assume is a ghost, turning the pass to nowhere into an own goal. 2-0 Hawks. In desperation, just trying to deny the puck to get to the front of the net. Goes right off his right glove and in behind Steve Mason. Midway through the second, Jared Bowl tries to change the complexion of the game as he goads Ben Eager into a fight. Bowl gets the worst of the fight, the Chicago crowd is fired up, but hopefully so are the Blue Jackets. It doesn't take long before the Jackets have something to show for their morale change as Vermette finishes a shot in close, his seventh goal in only 15 games since being acquired. Vermette makes another play only a couple minutes later, capitalizing on a Jalmerson miscue and feeding the puck to fellow midseason acquisition Jason Williams, who ties the game at two. Vermette's going to get to the goal, put it in front, open side, they score, Williams on a great feed from Vermette. And the Columbus Blue Jackets, eight minutes into the second, have tied the game. Havlat breaks the tie late in the frame with an insanely quick release and beautifully placed shot over Mason's blocker. The third grinds on and the Blue Jackets fail to find the back of the net. But on a chaotic shift, the captain finds some open space. Actually, Seabrook, a partial block. That actually broke Seabrook's stick. Valhotra, Seabrook without a cue, gloved it forward. It didn't get out. Now came in front of shot. He scores! And the Jackets have tied the game as Rick Nash got the puck back on his backhand. The third period closes without a winner, so on to OT. These are the days of 4-on-4 four four overtime, so chances are relatively few until a Tootin penalty puts Chicago on the man advantage for the last 30 seconds of extra time. Patrick Kane fires a beautiful pass to Havlat, who seemingly has Mason dead to rights. Maybe the biggest single save to this point in Blue Jackets history has sent this to a shootout. Fedor Tutin is marched out for his first attempt of the season as the Blue Jackets' second shooter, and he buries his opportunity. Mason stones all three Blackhawks, and the Jackets are headed to the playoffs. The Jackets lose their last two games, and Mason struggles in both. Due to their limping into the season, Columbus is the seventh seed in the West. Their matchup isn't good news. The Detroit Red Wings just won the Stanley Cup, then they added Marion Hosa. To say they're good is too obvious. The Blue Jackets have four 40 point scorers Nash, Husalius, Umberger, and thanks to his late season heater, Vermette. The Red Wings have 11. Captain Nick Lidstrom is having a down year. He'll only finish third in Norris voting this year as opposed to winning it like he has the last three years. Leading scorer Pavel Datsuk will win both the Selkie and Lady Bing trophies and finish third for the Hart. There's reigning playoff MVP Henrik Zetterberg, the aforementioned Hosa with his 40 goals, Brian Rafalski, who will finish top 10 in Norris voting. I could go on and on. This team has bottomless depth. This team does, however, have one obvious flaw. Their top goalie for the playoffs is Chris Osgood. Fresh off a season where he wasn't good at all, boasting an 887 save percentage. If the Blue Jackets want to win this series, it will hinge on Mason outdueling Osgood. Detroit, game one. It's time for the Blue Jackets to play their first ever playoff game. For the Columbus Blue Jackets, the potential rookie of the year, Steve Mason. 2-2-1 two, two and one this season against Detroit. Makes a 14th consecutive start, but he struggled in April. 16 goals against in five April starts. Was he getting tired? 
It takes half the game for the first goal to be scored, but following an up-and-down sequence, Val Filpula sets up Yuri Hoodler on a two-on-one who takes advantage. Russell tries for a half second to play the shot instead of the pass and gets burned. Seconds later, a vicious forecheck effort by Umberger knocks the puck loose to Voracek, who sends the puck right back to Umberger, setting up the tying goal. Detroit doesn't take long to respond. Jonathan Erickson lobs a puck on net that Manny Malhotra decides to try and catch, directly in front of Mason, who, you may notice, has a large catching glove heading right for the puck. Malhotra's efforts deflect the puck right over Mason and into the net. Manny Malhotra's glove, 27. Watch him reach right there. Oh my goodness. A power play allows Detroit to strike again within the minute this time on a blast from Cronwall that Mason never sees thanks to a screen from Johan Franzen. Franzen puts the game out of reach in the third, taking advantage of Mason not being solid on his post. Detroit takes game one. Columbus loses game two. They're shut out 4 nothing. It isn't a very graceful loss. When the Blue Jackets won in the regular season, they were a very strong possession team and a very sound defensive team. Detroit has obliterated that. In the offensive zone, Columbus can't cycle. Their best shifts result in few shots and mediocre chances. They are completely unable to complete passes or get to the front of the net. They possess the puck, yes, but never cleanly and never resulting in high-quality chances. In the defensive zone, Columbus's massive defense core, theoretically, was built to keep guys out of the crease, but they have no answer for the slickness of Datsuk or the sheer mass of the 6'4", 230-pound Franzen, whose strength earned him the nickname the Mule. Along with Zetterberg. Zetterberg, he's got it, scores! Top shelf shot, 3-0 Red Wings, Henrik Zetterberg! The first playoff game in Columbus is an absolute must-win. Guys, things aren't looking good. RJ scored again, but the only two goals for Columbus this series are on weird backhands right in front of Osgood's face. Do I need to remind you that Osgood at this point in his career is bad? You know Vesa Toscala? Toronto is in the process of running that man out on a rail. By pretty much every statistic, Osgood has been worse this year. Goals saved above expected is a pretty good way to boil down goaltending to just one number. Establishing a cumulative number of expected goals based on things like shot location and pre-shot passing, and comparing that number to actual goals allowed. Toscala, for example, has a GSAX this year of negative 17.7. Osgood, despite playing fewer games, has a GSAX of negative 19. Even though the Blue Jackets let in shots this game, they're stuck on the outside. It's easy to say just shoot on the man, but the Detroit defense is impenetrable and tight, totally willing to give up deep lobs. Mason hasn't been great, but the offense isn't giving them a chance. Game 4, last chance for someone not named Umberger to score. When Lidstrom scores early thanks to a bad bounce off Tootin, it looks like this is going to be a replay of the first three games. But finally, the Jackets respond. Christian Husalius lasers home the tying goal and the fans come to life. A lot of pressure, yes, but Rick is going to have to deal with that. Look out. Scores! Tie game! Then, traffic in front. Detroit goal. Deja vu. The Wings take the lead 3-1 as Mason falls victim to a bad bounce off the rear boards. Just off the outside, Clint scores! Dan Clary gets the goal! Early in the second, Nash finally finds himself on the score sheet. Bingo ball, lines they score! Tipped in front of the goal, Rick Nash! And it's three to two. Umberger, of course, ties the game on a goal that was pretty close to offside, but no review for that yet, so the game marches on. Then, traffic in front, Detroit goal, deja vu. Hosa strikes a few minutes later on a terrific feed from Thomas Holmstrom. lead by a pair. But Columbus isn't dead yet. Puck squirted free. No one there in a white sweater to tap it home and a break the other way. The defenseman Russell is up. Russell shoots, scores! (laughs) 
The Columbus depth has pulled them within one. The injury-plagued Freddie Modine, who just made it back for the start of this series, drives to the net to dunk a rebound. We're all tied up at five each, heading to the third. Scoring stops cold in the third, but a too many men on the ice penalty has put Detroit on the power play for the rest of regulation. Columbus protested vehemently, but it's pretty blatant. 47 seconds left. Traffic in front. Detroit goal. Deja vu. The mule has completed the sweep. It will take a team with two of the best five players in the world to finally beat this Detroit squad as they fall to the Penguins in a rematch of last year's finals. Nash and Mason drug this team to the playoffs, but this group of Jackets will never get them there again. Rick Nash, despite consistently sterling play in Columbus, won't find his playoff success until he trades a blue jacket for a blue shirt. Mason never recaptures the magic that won him the Calder and nearly won him the Vesna and Hart. He struggles massively over the next few seasons until a trade to Philadelphia sparks his play once again. Looking at his G-Sacks for the next season, it's grim. The Blue Jackets will have to wait for another electric winger and superstar goalie before they can make their way out of the first round, but now even that era has passed. As the team is rebuilt again, as hope is slowly reborn, they can never forget the first squad that made it. everyone to the middle of the ice and then Jake Bean the defenseman all the defensemen are on their toes here to start this game for the Blue Jackets Fantilli shot creates the rebound and there's Bean on the spot and the Blue Jackets are on the board and there are the Fantillis yeah boy are they excited first National Hockey League point Adam Fantilli 